there are some initiatives which appear to give significant advantages. Let's take, for example, home insulation, where the government already has a program and in the budget announced that it was going to add some additional resources to insulate more homes. And here's an example where the climate is a winner because we can reduce energy consumption and make that energy available for other uses that will reduce emissions. But in addition, an insulated home provides health and well-being benefits to the occupants, whether the home is owned by the state or local authorities or not-for-profits or owner-occupiers or private landlords. So making better New Zealand's homes, of which about half a million are estimated to be under-insulated, seems like one of those projects that, so long as well supervised by quality installers, gives New Zealand a long-lived asset when we're taking on long-term debt. So New Zealand currently generates about 85% of all of its electricity from renewable sources, of which hydro is the largest, most understood one, but additional wind farms and small amounts of solar are already being brought online. It's clear that electrification is one of the known technologies that can be used to reduce our carbon footprint. Electrification for home heating, electrification for electric vehicles, electrification for the space heating and industry, uh, as well as some industrial processes that can be electrified. So investing to increase New Zealand's capacity to generate electricity from renewable sources, to distribute that electricity to where it needs to be, is a significant investment opportunity with no regrets. And I know, Rob, the Commission has also talked sort of specifically about transport, in particular rail and ferries. So what's of particular interest in, for example, rail is given we have a rail network, it's what runs on the rails that matters a lot in terms of emissions and emissions reduction. These are long-lived assets, the engines that pull the trains. So electrification of the rail network and making sure that we decarbonize the fleet of engines is a significant multi-decade investment opportunity. We need to make sure that we take this opportunity to reduce the carbon footprint from our trains. The ferries that cross Cook Strait are near the end of their economic life, and the government in the budget allocated money to replace those ferries. We need to make sure that we invest wisely so that the carbon footprint from the ferries on Cook Strait is as low as possible for as long as possible. And if that means we have to defer the actual spend to make sure that we have the best technology before we lock in those emissions for the next 30 or 40 years, then the Commission would say, take the time and do it right. Because once you're on that pathway, you've locked it in for decades to come. And as the government decides where to make these big investments, how important is it that it puts a climate lens over its long-term decision-making? Well, the Commission believes that it is incredibly important, not just for central government in a COVID stimulus world, but for all investment decisions going forward, whether they're made by central or local government, by public-private sector, these investments now need to all be looked at through a climate change lens. They need to be looked at understanding that New Zealand, like all nations, is on a pathway to reduce our emissions from our productive and consumption activities, and that we need to prepare New Zealand for a warmer, wetter, windier, and in places drier future. Every investment needs to be looked at through that lens. Do you worry that as businesses focus on recovering losses that they might not prioritise sustainability and and conducting their businesses in the most sustainable way they can? I am sure that every household and every business is going to be absolutely focused on staying in business or getting back to business and that that will mean the risk of a much shorter term focus. But now is the time for leadership, 
leadership from government and business, that there are opportunities here to invest, to stimulate the economy, and to invest wisely for the future. That's the important part of this conversation. It's not an either or, but it can't be back to the business that we were doing five years ago or even a year ago. Some of those businesses are out of business. What economic benefits could there be, for example, jobs, if we do continue to move towards our climate change goals? Well, I think the opportunity is for new skills, as well as the increase in the deployment of skills in climate action projects and programs of work. So it's not necessarily the case that everybody is right-sized and in the right place to undertake the kinds of projects and programs that are consistent with climate action. But it is the case that much work needs to be done. And while particular roles or jobs may not come back, new roles and new jobs doing new work is going to be required. And whether that's an adaptation and the relocation of nearshore infrastructure, whether that's in adoption of new technologies to reduce carbon emissions, whether that's in understanding the science of climate change or the public policy of climate action, there are going to be significant new roles now and tomorrow to support our move to a low emissions economy. Early days to be able to understand uh, the true impact of the COVID lockdown and the unfolding pathway we're now on. How much of the change in people's experiences, how much of the disruption in business as usual is merely transient, that we'll work through and put it back how it was, and how much may cause permanent changes in what we produce and how we produce it, where we work and where we live. For example, it's quite conceivable that some underlying trends towards more distributed workplaces and more digital engagement will put more pressure and opportunities for rolling out high capacity digital infrastructure. At the same time, it may reduce the demands on other types of infrastructure that required many people to move from where they live to where they work. But exactly how that plays out remains to be seen. Hurrying to get everybody back into the CBD so they can go buy coffee at the local coffee shop is nuts. We need to figure out whether there are lower carbon footprints from having certain jobs always done remote from the CBD rather than moving people into a CBD. Have your experiences during lockdown changed the way you view what's important? Well, certainly uh, prior to lockdown in my uh, role as a director of a number of companies and as chairman of the Climate Change Commission, uh, there was a reasonable amount of, of travel. Uh, as a consequence of lockdown, that travel was removed from my diary. And in reflecting on it, it is pretty clear that there are some circumstances where being there matters a lot in family occasions, uh, in certain types of engagements. There is no near substitute for being there. But there are also significant opportunities where you can be present without being there. And that learning that we've all gone through, that competence that we've developed and the confidence we have about using presence without being there to get business done, I think is potentially a long-term advantage for lifestyles, less time invested in travel, and for the environment, less emissions and moving our bodies around from place to place. So that may be one of the more permanent changes, but to lock it in requires businesses and employers to change their expectations, as well as for workers to embrace different ways of working. I also think lockdown wasn't necessarily a fair test of working from home. When some were required to deliver childcare and home-based education, along with developing and delivering their professional competencies. 
I think probably once the kids go back to school, as they now have, there may be a better quality experience for many who are working from home. If you could set a new course for New Zealand's future, what would your priorities be? Two in particular. One is to create a much more sustainable society. And by sustainable, I would have three agendas. Do no harm, put it right, and make it better. And the do no harm means we really do have to stop doing dumb things that make the situation worse. The putting it right means this generation has an obligation to future generations, not to merely pass on what we have done, but to put it back how it should have been all along. And finally, I think there are significant opportunities to create a better future, a brighter, cleaner, greener, healthier, more resilient future for the generations to come. And I would also focus on it being an inclusive society, that we cannot create a community where alienated and disaffected groups and vulnerable groups pose a threat to the stability and prosperity of all. And lastly, Rod, um, can you think of the time where having a vision meant extraordinary things were achieved? Well, I reflect on the time in February 2011 after the Christchurch earthquakes uh, while I was vice chancellor at the University of Canterbury. And the university's vision statement, which we had reviewed a couple of years before, of tangata tua, tangata ora, people prepared to make a difference, was certainly front of mind when in those early days and weeks after the earthquakes, we had to prioritise what were we going to do and why were we going to do those things? And reminding ourselves that the heart of that academic institution were its people, its students and its staff and all the people who made learning and research possible. And that the priority wasn't about the buildings, it was about the people. And that certainly is a reminder that having meaning and purpose to what we do is incredibly important in shaping and delivering a better future. So put people at the centre of the conversation about climate action, the conversation about recovery, the conversation that we need to have about how do we create a sustainable, inclusive future for people.